All right, Aloha Love Tribe. Let's everybody take a big inhale of love together. And exhale some peace out into this planet. Okay, I am so honored and privileged to have one of my oldest soul brothers here who is a musical magician and somebody who has inspired me as an artist. And I feel like I constantly have been watching you and your career over the years, and I keep seeing you evolve and change and transmute, but you still have the same potency of music is the medicine of your soul. And I see that you keep delivering this to the masses. And so my dear friend, Evan Blue Tech is with us, and we're going to get to talk about his new album and his new music video and what he's doing to help make a difference on the planet. Hi, sweetheart. Aloha. Hi. <laughs> oh my gosh so how's it going there for you in sunny san diego well it's actually not sunny at the moment we got our, our first rain of a long time last night which it it's such a rarity like everybody basically pulls off the side of the road and oh the sky is falling oh whoa it's rain something's happening oh my so. god okay so let's let's we're gonna dive super quick into the driving off the side of the road okay and so at, at Dance Our Dreams, we have all these different things that we talk about, and we have our hacks of the week and the songs of the week and the SDGs of the week. And Evan and I were talking about what's important to him about like a little micro life hack. And, and I, want to sh I want you to share like what is super important for you lately because it's been like infiltrating the rest of your day if you don't handle it well. And it has to do with oh. the road. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to have a discussion about road rage. Road rage! <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it, it's amazing, amazing to me no matter how chill I can be, like, oh, I just spent, you know, 45 minutes on, on the cushion meditating, blah, 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 going about my day, and amazing how quickly I can uh, lose all of that equanimity and just be fucking annoyed at people not driving like normal people, which San Diego is a city that has a large amount of tourists here often, so people don't know where they're going. So my, my life hack is, has been to view other people's annoying driving as an opportunity for mindfulness. So it mm. starts with counting my breaths to 10 mm. and then purposefully putting myself in the slow lane or letting person pass or go in front of me, like finding a way to just slow down and be present in the moment and that particular practice is tiny, just counting, counting the 10 breaths. But if I do that, I find that all of a sudden my journey to wherever I'm going becomes this like experience. I notice a tree I never noticed before. I'm listening to the song on the radio instead of focusing on where I want to be. I'm focusing on where I am and driving becomes not an aggro thing and not something that causes me rage. It becomes an opportunity for meditation and reconnecting with myself and, and expanded awareness. And then you get where you're going and you're in a good mood. And yeah, that I, those little things I think ripple out for everybody's day and everybody around you. They totally do. And you were saying earlier about just how like, if you show up to the next place that you're going to, if you've experienced the road rage as it were, and you forgot to kind of get grounded and cleanse yourself, like how does that affect your, your meeting yeah. or your experience well, or your date or whatever you're doing? Yeah. Getting cut off by somebody on the road, like can be super aggravating and anxious and you get to where you're going and you're frustrated. And the first thing out of your mouth is, Oh, the stupid person did the stupid thing. And like, it's, it is, it's retraining those neural pathways of like, oh, wow, okay, this thing that usually causes me tension just occurred. Well, that is now an opportunity for me to like, oh, let's check in. Where's my breath at? Oh, look, 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 I'm, my shoulders are clenched. Look at the way I'm responding to this. <laughs> like, okay, cool. That's a great training yourself for the, that to be a trigger for mindfulness and a trigger for awareness and checking in with yourself. Like, generally makes your day way more groovy if you're not pissed off driving. <laughs> I'm a big so, fan of groovy days. Oh that's, my that's my, that's my little life hack. And I mean, on that same, that same note, like finding reminders, finding ways to remind yourself to check in is a, a really powerful practice, especially when it's normal things like, Oh, when I'm standing in the line in the grocery store, that's a great time to check in with my breath and like, use it as a walking meditation. Like anything can become an opportunity to meditate and, and be aware if we begin to notice those things that are reoccurring. Normal mundane experiences of our life can become mystical and expanded. Walking the dog. 
Totally. Getting in traffic, getting your coffee. Like yeah. those can all be opportunities for self-reflection and deep connection with something larger. And so do you have like, and I completely agree with you and I always resonate with like the standing in line at the grocery store thing as a like reminder of like, okay, look at you. You get to have groceries. You have money to buy groceries, take a deep breath, be cool. And you get to have your like, your life is your meditation, like deep. But I forget probably eight times out of 10, right? And so I'm trying to train myself to remember. So do you have a little like a rubber band or something that helps you sort of remember? That's why it's called a practice. (laughs) (laughs) If we we had mastered it, then we probably would be uh, floating in the Himalayas and Lotus. (laughs) Um, No, no, I don't. I, I mean, other than like, like right now telling myself, oh yeah, cool, I'm talking about it. Remember the next time somebody cuts you off to like be a chill dude and use it as an opportunity for meditation. So the more you do that, the more you train the mind with the reward of like, oh wait, I actually feel good. So the the response, it's it's the whole, you know, Pavlovian response. You begin to train your mind that the reward system is better to have the feeling of equanimity and peace than it is that endorphin charge of being pissed off. Totally. So, it's like, uh, it's like working with kids. Oh, I, there's that thing you're holding on to, but like, hey, this is also really cool too. Try it to them for a while. Oh yeah. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Um, let's, let's talk about your, your album and your song and the beautiful video that you shared with me. I got a sneak peek at his video and you look so great and oh, radiant yeah. and happy. And I love all the, the hometown San Diego goodness. So tell me about the story of this album and, how it relates to your breath and how it's relating to your presence practice. The video is actually exactly what I was talking about. So I, if I ever were to write a book, which who knows, you know, we'll see what happens. You know. uh, it would be called the mysticism of the mundane. So it's, it's been a thing for years and years and years for me of just noticing like literally last night, sitting with a friend, having a glass of wine, listening to jazz. I'm talking about finding sacred beauty everywhere. And I was like, look at the beams on the ceiling of this place that we're sitting. Mm -hmm. And if you look, there are opportunities for immense wonder and just ecstatic experience of beauty around you everywhere. The the wood grain of this table that I'm sitting in front of right now, if I remove my focused what I got to be doing awareness and allow myself to sink into actual observing and seeing, then that's mystical and beautiful. So this, this music video is literally... I wanted to, in some ways, demystify the process of connecting to something deeper. I was, I was walking down the street after mm-hmm. going to you know, 7-Eleven for toilet paper or something, and I saw in my mind's eye this, the whole video of a person standing in quietness while life spun around them, like finding the mysticism of the moment, finding your mm-hmm. sacred fucking chapel at the line in the grocery store. So the, I was like, oh, I actually can make this happen. Like all we have to do is film and just speed it up time-lapse. And you know, I've always had these grandiose ideas of animated videos and short films I want to do. And I look at the budget and I'm like, okay, well that's not going (laughs) to (laughs) happen. So this one, I was like, Oh shit, I can actually direct and edit this whole project myself. I just need someone who has a, a quality camera to capture good footage. And Luckily, they ended up having a drone. So we got some footage, you know, zooming into these, gorgeous cliffs in San Diego, but a uh, very, very affordable, easy video to make. It's, it's me standing in quietness and I, it was an opportunity to meditate, especially because like people are going, you know, what the hell is this guy doing? What a weirdo, like hearing all these bits of conversation and how people were engaging with somebody who wasn't like active, who was sitting in or standing in silence was mm-hmm. really the part of the meditation for me that became powerful. And all my feelings of like, oh my God, what am I doing? How, how, like, who am I to pretend like I know shit about shit and try to tell people how they should live their lives and what's going to bring them peace and all of those voices. And oh my God, I can't believe I'm, you know, almost 20 years now in the music industry. It's my first music video. Wow. Um, yeah. So the, the, the video documents me letting all of those things go and finding my Zen in that moment, finding my like, taking taking the the machinations of the mind and all those loops and those cycles and the choo-choo trains of chaos that run through our brains and literally just setting them aside and being where I was for those moments. And so we did, you know, five, six minute long shots that then get sped up to 30 seconds. So 
you see me standing in relatively little motion, <laughs> but life is like spinning around me at, you know, seven times. Yeah, totally. Uh Oh, you just broke up. Oh, are you there, my love? I don't know if it's my connection or yours. Okay, there you are. Okay, yeah, no, little little back. bit of an internet glitch. My my internet seems to be wonky today, but so I think okay, so it's so like, yeah. Go keep going. You said seven times speeding up. Right. Okay, so seven times speed. Everything's going fast. That was the concept of the video, and I'm really really happy with how it turned out. So it it was a a major milestone for me. This whole process of this record of like, you know, now in my 40s, having been doing this for about 20 years, being on stage, but never putting my face in front of the music, always hiding behind the art and the message. And, oh, I want the music to speak for itself. I'm not a star. I'm not a star. I'm not a star. Well, you know what? Fuck it. I'm a star. I, I can be that. And I can say that with humility and like absolute awe and wonder that people have given me the opportunity to stand on a platform and speak about things that matter to me. So yeah. this record has been a like, you know, I'm, I'm actually not afraid of my own light. I'm going to, I'm going to step into that. I'm going to be beautiful and radiate from the inside and own that shit because yes. fuck, that's what I'm here to do. <laughs> so. Dude, I know. I think it was like, I always have this analogy and I love hearing you say this two things you said, you it sounded like you had kind of some imposter syndrome uh, going on. Like, who am I to tell people like how to live and all these oh, things. I, and it then, doesn't matter how big the stage is or yeah. where I'm playing it. That's still things that go through my head of like, well, oh, when are they going to figure out that I'm not actually very good? Oh, God, dude. Oh, this is every artist. I swear to God, everybody I talk to has the exact same, like one day the, the curtain's going to come back and they're going to realize I'm like the little guy pulling the things. And I was like, no, you're not. You're the fucking giant, magnificent flower that God made you, God, spirit, universe, whatever the world, you know, whatever your word of the day is for that. But like, mama God, mama God, mama Gaia, you know, like I think of, and I, I can so relate, you know, cause I feel sort of this, like, there's this part of me that wants to step forward and I want to invite others to step forward in their own greatness and their own beauty but there's this part of me that's like, well, who the heck am I so, to do that? And, and I think, of course, you know, Marianne Williamson, you know, who are you not to shine? And yeah, I, think, I, I know who she is. I'm not actually familiar with her work, but that, yeah, that sounds amazing. Well, and it's like, you think of like a garden, Evan, like think about like, if you're, let's say you're God, if, if God is separate from you and you're like, like, woohoo, I'm going to go plant my garden, right? I'm going to put all these uh, the purple flowers here and the pink ones here. La la la. Here's my garden. And then all the flowers kind of looked up and they're like, well, am I allowed to bloom? Because if I am really big and bright, it might make this other flower next to me not feel so good. So maybe I should just sort of be like this little baby flower instead of the really big flower that I'm supposed to be. Yeah. And then we fucking shrink as humans. And it's like, I don't think the gardener, otherwise you know, known as spirit God, like wants us to shrink. Like we want the garden. Yeah, You're not doing anybody any favors by hiding your light. Yeah. Because letting... Owning your power is the most humbling thing that you can possibly do. And the funny thing about that is that the backlash from people is that like, oh, you're bragging or, oh, you're being arrogant. It's actually the most humbling fucking thing because when you accept your own light, you realize that every man and woman is a star and has this amazing, incredible ability to inspire and touch and, you know, reweave the connections between beings around them and we're all just so fucking afraid to be beautiful that we push that shit down or we're so trying to get you know kim kardashian's butt or whatever image we think that we're supposed to be that's not what we are like yeah you're not doing anybody favors man be beautiful be beautiful baby i love oh my god i love this message so much and and you told me um uh like a week ago when we were starting to kind of get, get on this, that you had another beautiful accomplishment accomplishment. Do you want to share that, that uh, about your physical health? Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, part of the whole, I, you know, I lived in Hawaii for many years, moved to the mainland. I, I don't think we were recording when we were talking about that, but no, we weren't. No, no. Okay. So I saw 40 approaching quickly, which I am now well over that line. And I, I had a little like come to Jesus with myself where I was like, okay, you're fat. You're not happy. Like 40 is either going to be a like slow slide into everything feeling worse and worse, or it could be the best decade of your life. Mm -hmm. And I was like, 
I'm going to make it the best decade of my life. I choose joy. That's what I'm going for. So lost 75 pounds I've gained lots of like hotness. I mean, you've always been hot, but holy hotness. <laughs> they have been like, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, I, I want to be, I want to be the best me that I can be. I want to see what that looks like. For me, it was discovering running really was, was the thing of like, oh my God, there's a goal that I can achieve. I'm one of those weirdos that actually loves running more than 10 miles. And for wow. some reason, I get off on it. <laughs> but I mean, it's, it's, it sounds so cliche, but that whole process of losing weight is also like letting go of, of some self-limiting belief systems about who you are and what you're allowed to be. So it, yeah. in many ways, it's like, I keep calling it my quinceanera, like <laughs> moving to San Diego, just, or my sister calls me Evan 2.0. Like it, it nice. I not only lost weight physically, I lost a lot of filters that I've been laying over my own ability to be myself. And that means owning my dark and owning my light and being like, Hey, I'm fucked up. I have anxiety. I need some help. Like, Hey, I'm reaching out people. This is my truth. Like, can, can, can I get a, can I get that hug up in here? You know, like being beautiful is also letting your shadow be beautiful and giving other people permission to be themselves by not hiding that, not being the perfect Instagram filter. You being like the, here's me with a booger on my face, like being a beautiful human. Yeah. So, that was kind of a rambling response, but it's beautiful. Well, and one thing you said that really touches me, and I think it's something that a lot of people struggle with, and I have struggled with it myself, and I still, in this exact moment as we stand here, I struggle with the, the three of the most simple words is, I need help. Yeah. It's really hard for people to ask. Do you need to get the dog? Hold on one second. The, the landlord's yard guys just showed up and they're going to start weed whacking around the house. I'm going to go ask them if they could please come back later. Just give, just give, it, give it one minute, guys. All right, cool. I'm going to pause you. Yeah, okay, just pause me for one second. Okay, <laughs> okay we're back on. Okay, so I, I, I was making the assumption that nobody wants to listen to a weed whacker in the background for the rest of this process. It's, it's a great assumption. I thought I started hearing something loud. I was like, ooh, yeah. is that like a jet out there? But yeah. Yeah, um, that's the weed whacker, and there's two of them, so they're on both sides of the house. Just, I feel like it's like, oh my god, that scene from Star Wars where they're in the compactor, and it's just, ah! oh my god, that was seriously one of the most stressful scenes I've ever seen because I just felt like, oh my god, how are they going to get out of this one? Like that was yeah. a really stressful scene to watch. Okay, um, so wait, where were we? I, we were talking about three words that I need help, and oh, you, yeah. you were claiming your power and your vulnerability. And asking for your friends for like, hey, can I get a hug up here? You know, I mean, like not even just that. Like, I have no problem being public on my social media about like, oh, hey, cool. I on the outside it looks like I'm this you know successful artist and everything's going great and like I'm totally anxious. This is yeah. what happens in my life. I have anxiety. I doubt who I am. Like, and that's not a hey, everyone feed my you know me massage me this whole of need. It's like no, actually, I'm talking about it. So you, wherever you are, whoever you are, goes like, oh, wait, I'm actually normal. It's totally normal to have anxiety and wonder where your place is and if you're having an impact or what the fuck we're doing here, you know? Yeah. And so, so thinking, talking about what the fuck we're doing here, let's talk about this meaning of life. And we talked about this a little bit before we started recording about the, the 144,000. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about that, my brother. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of my favorite parables. So there, there's a Kabbalistic parable about when the, and we're, we're, we're going Judeo-Christian up in this business for a minute. It's so uh, it's a parable about when the Torah was delivered. So, you know, the, the mythology is that, oh, cool, you know, this fucking divine inspiration Torah was given to the Jews, blah, 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 blah. The Kabbalistic take on that, which, you know, Kabbalah is like the, the mystical side of Judaism says, actually, there's 144,000 different Torahs one Torah for every single person who was present who took a breath mm. at that time, which uh, we, were, we were talking about the all is one. Everyone is all is one. I'm like, no, 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 all is one. All is also many. Like every one has their own experience and their own connection to source, divinity, God, goddess, whatever you want to call that. So, yeah, I think it's super powerful. And I think about, 
I think about this artwork behind me, these mosaics. Like I'm, I love mosaic art and I love obviously our musical art. And I love that there's so many different pieces and you take little tiny pieces, like 144,000 pieces and you make a whole, you make this whole piece of art out of it, but it's still the pieces, but it's still the whole of it all. And I think of our life that way as, as these, you know, spiritual beings and these little human vehicles, you know? Yeah. Or, or like, yeah, I guess today is Kabbalah day. It's, 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 uh, one of the other images is, is called the Adam Kadmon. And it's like, each one of us is like a spark cell in the body of this thing that actually becomes the divinity or is a reflection of the divinity standing, looking at God. Each one of us is like a, a star cell in the body of that thing, which like where I was going with that is like, everyone has their own unique perspective on it. It's one of the things I've really tried to shy away from with my work in general is like, how do we talk about spirituality and connection and meditation and whatever it is without being like, Oh, and this is the way you should follow it mm. because everyone has their own path in man. Yeah. Like your religion is personal. Your spirituality is personal. Your connection to don't even have to call it God, whatever language works for you, higher self, higher intelligence, intuition, like doesn't matter to me, just, open the fucking door inside and see what's inside there. So like the, the album Holotrope features some, some more direct spiritual imagery than I've used before, but I, I made very clear not to be like, and Oh, everybody go out and like explore Theravada Buddhism or whatever. Like, I don't care what it is for you, man. If, if like walking on the beach, picking shells is what connects you to something higher and, allows you to manage your anxiety and feel like you're a part of the flow of the universe. Fucking awesome. That's what you should do. If it's like being at the meal, uh, the what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, being at the meal counter, feeding the homeless on Saturday morning is your way to connect to God. Then fucking do it, man. That's your thing. Don't let anybody tell you that because you don't meditate or you don't speak in tongues or you're not doing this or that or whatever practice, like it doesn't matter. Like, the, the message, and again, with the video, like trying to show the mysticism of the mundane is that everything is a temple, everything is sacred, any moment can be your entry into it, whatever you're doing, just engage with it, just open up to that possibility. So true. Oh my God. And I love like the mysticism and the mundane feel so important. Do you know who Ram Dass is? I do, yeah, yeah. So he's one of my first teachers, I love him so much. I was listening to a podcast from him the other day and he was talking I'm about his... With Justin Breda, who did that record with him. Oh, wow. Uh, um, Justin, Justin from the Glitch Mob did an ambient record with Ram Dass recently. Oh my God. I mean, he's just, there's something about him because he doesn't have the pretense of this, exactly what you just said. Like you're supposed to meditate this way and you're supposed yeah. to do all the things, you know, and I just, I've always resonated with his, the way that he messages, but he talks about his guru coming up sometimes in the most random situations, whether it's the traffic or the angry guy or whatever. And he's always giggles. And he's like, every time one of these obstacles come into my, my field, it's an opportunity for me to like, you know, connect with that mysticism of like, this really isn't an obstacle. It's an opportunity for me to either chill or tune in or be compassionate and lean into this person who might be angry or whatever it is. And so he's really developed this, this technology within himself to like reframe the mundane to the mystic. And I love how you're yes. you know, saying that. That's exactly what I'm saying about the, for me, the, the okay, when, when does anxiety really hit me worst? It's usually around finances and driving is driving is the little one. So that's like the, Oh, there's the little demon. Okay, cool. Um, anything can be an object of meditation. So the whole point of meditation is you focus on a thing and it gives, it gives the monkey mind something to like engage itself with so that you can then expand into larger perceptual awareness. So yeah. anything can be that traffic for me. Really great. We all experience it on a, daily basis or on a multiple daily basis like why can that not be just as sacred as being in you know a temple on a mat with fucking lotus flowers and have burning the stuff yeah. and being all hippied yeah. out right like, like what's the difference why why can't anything be that why can't anything be an opportunity to be like oh right like i am not my thoughts i am bigger than this moment 
things are connected. Like use, use the mundane as an opportunity. Doing laundry is like super sacred time for me. Love it. Like doing laundry is just the repetition of these objects and like thinking about the fibers and, Oh, these are clothes. And I, I'm this like super, I live in this amazing affluent society where I have all these different things and, you know, watching the colors and folding them like that becomes a sacred meditation for me. It's like church when I do laundry. So oh, wow. anything can, anything can become that. And the, the, the power is in finding things that naturally bring up the part of the self that wants to reject and push away and, Oh, I don't like that. Or that's not for me or that's going to hurt me. Those are the opportunities where, mindfulness becomes something more than just spiritual masturbation. Like <laughs> it's easy. It's easy to all be groovy when everything feels good and you're surrounded by beauty. Like how do you be groovy and not be an anxious wreck when shit sucks when you're in line at DMV? Totally. So. Oh my God. And that's the, that's the, that's really where the medicine hits the road. You know, I remember that's, like that's the video is about is me standing. Like I'm not, like a, very much, I I originally even imagined some like animation and making it spiritual. And I was like, actually, no, 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 no. It's me like standing, it didn't make it into the final cut, but like standing on Newport Avenue in Ocean Beach with like hodads in the background was one of the things. And I was like, let this be the sacred space, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. It's all sacred. And and I love that. And it can be. The difference. It, it can be. Yes. Is, is literally one one like mental Instagram filter of perception of like, Oh wait, now it's sacred. Just the choosing to see it that way. Yeah. It's that choosing. And it's that, re it's that mindfulness to say yes to that. Right now I'm choosing that this part where my child isn't talking to me or the being in the middle of traffic or whatever the heck is going on. I'm choosing that this is sacred and this is all part of the bigger thing. And it's not, you know, and I mean, the, the reality is, is in that moment, we usually don't have the presence of mind to be like, oh, I'm super spiritual, everything's sacred. But I love you're like, it. Ah. You're like, uh, I'm fucking annoyed. Oh, actually, cool. I'm going to count my breath. Yeah. Okay. How about I check in with myself for a minute and like, okay, cool. Use this as an opportunity. And, and I'm not going to say it's always going to work, but if you begin that as a practice, then I have a feeling your life is actually going to start chilling out a little bit. And so do you think, because I heard you say 10 breaths earlier, which is like a lot of breaths to me. I think even if I can get through three mindful breaths, I'm doing a good job at something. So. I'm, I'm not talking like, I'm talking whatever breath I'm having, like count my inhales or Got count it. my exhales to 10. I'm driving, you know, got to deal with the blinker and all this stuff. I'm not, you know, going into super deep conscious breathing. It's just count 10 breaths. It's something that's cyclical and sure. regular and consistent that we can hold on to as a like, uh, a reminder of mindfulness. I love it. And I so that I don't, I don't control the breath. I don't try to make it bigger or smaller than it is. I just observe the breath for a count of 10. Okay. Still anxious count to 10 again. It's, it's actually something I learned in marathon training that, mm. Oh my God, I'm so tired. I can't believe this hill is coming up. I totally want to give up. I'm like, I will count 30 breaths. And if I still feel like giving up at the end of 30, then we'll relook at where things are. And so somehow the process of counting 30 breaths while I'm running, like you get back into the flow, the runner's high. And I'm usually like, Oh, and I, I begin to use it as a technique for my races where I will count up to 30 while I'm counting up to 30. I'm focused on push the muscles, drive, drive, drive. As I count down from 30, my focus is on breathe, take in oxygen, relax the body, make sure blood is flowing, notice any aches. And, and I've been able to, to run that cycle of counting breaths through miles and miles and miles. And so wow. I just kind of adapted it. To, you know, 10 is an arbitrary number. If, if 17 is your magic number, fuck, do 17. Pick a number and just, but pick something and do it. And so that sounds like a really fun experiment for everybody this week. Um, yeah, literally. When next time you're in traffic and it sucks, count 10 breaths. If you don't feel more relaxed at the end of that count, count another 10. Count to 777 if you need to. I don't know. <laughs> Pick away. But <laughs> the traffic's not going to get any faster with you being anxious and cussing at it. Totally. But you might be way more chill when you get to where you're going if you learn how to have some peace in that situation. Yeah. Oh, my God. And that's it. It's like you're giving yourself the gift of, 
of comfort by doing this. It's like you're, like you just said, you're not going to control the external. You're going to manage the internal. That's the big thing. That's yeah. actually the practice. The practice is not trying to make everything better. The practice is realizing that you have no control over circumstances. Yeah. What you do have control over is your response to circumstances. Yeah. And that's happiness, just like, happiness and joy is a choice. It is. And it's like always, it's such a simple philosophy. And of course we hear it all over, but it's like, holy cow, we need these sticky notes on our face all the time to remind us, like take those well, that, however many breaths, you know, on your face is your breath. It's always yeah. there. It's you can always, always wherever you are, whatever you're doing, take a moment and just observe the, the, the feeling of the breath going in and out of your body. Like that's, that's, the, the great gift of being human and physical is that our breath is, is a constant. It's the constant. It's the thing that we can always come back to as the, the center. Yeah. It's so magical. That's why so many contemplative traditions like have a breath meditation. That's why most meditators started with watching the breath before they move on to, you know, visualization or whatever else you do. Any of that good stuff. So I love that you're sharing all of this with, with everybody. What's your, you know, let's kind of, what's your next 50 years look like? What's your next vision? We were laughing about the, like getting started and, and, you know, talking about, I got to interview Roger Rom earlier and he's turning 80. Oh my God, this dude is magnificent. And, you know, here we are, you know, several decades younger than him. Um, as artists, like what's, what's your next, what's your next big chapter look like? Like, what are you hoping to to pull out of your beautiful soul and share with the world, honey. I mean, I, I definitely want to continue making music. I, I have gotten to a really peaceful place with music where I don't feel like I'm trying to accomplish anything. Mm -hmm. It's more like just opening the door and, and letting it come out. And I, I think because of that, because I'm not trying to control the process, I tend to write pretty fast and create a lot of music when I make space for it. So, um, Definitely want to see where that goes and what comes out of me and, and what what sounds are hanging around that, that want to use me as the instrument to get out to the world. Cool. Um, on a like career level, I, I would really like to get into film scoring and video game scoring and working with narratives, working with directors, providing the, the uh, emotional cinematography that happens through sound of, of character development and things that I, I can't do making a record, right? Right. Yeah, it's like a, obviously a different set and setting, you know, a dance floor or a loungy ambient room is very different than a journey for a film. Or, or Someone once told me that film is one of the greatest arts because it combines literature, music, visual, dance, like all of those things can happen in a film where like, yeah, all these different arts basically like are come together. So that's something that me making a record, like I'm not able to tell a narrative. Well, okay, I can tell a narrative through a record. Uh, the impact of the look in someone's eye when they're experiencing something life-changing that you can do with cinematography, not even with dialogue, like that's something that I can't convey in the medium of making a record. But working with a director and providing, like I said, the, the emotional cinematography around that moment, of the anticipation of the strings building or creating the space for that moment to occur. That's fucking awesome. That's something I would, I would love to evolve into with my heart. And your, your sound to me is like, it's, it's undeniably unique. Like mm. when I hear your music, it's you. There's, it's not like, Oh, is this three other artists? Nope. This is blue tech. This is Evan's music. And how did you, I, like you are really unique. Like you don't like there's certain, there's a few artists that I'm following and it's like, okay, that's desert dwellers. That's Evan. That's, you know, these Spongol, there's all these, you know, beautiful artists. And it's just like, how did you, I don't know. You've like, you took this thread and you're just like, this is, this is my little <laughs> jam over here and I'm going to do it. Well, and it's uh, I, I just follow my, I'm so far deep down my own rabbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, I mean, I've, I've developed uh, over the years, I obviously have a methodology, like a, a, a technique of how I approach the music making process. Um, for me, a lot of music is geometry. So I see, mm -hmm. I see geometric shapes and I'm often trying to transcribe geometric shapes into sound. Whoa. Okay, cool. It's a intuitive process for me. So for example, like if you see a, a mobile, right? 
you're like, okay, those are the points, the angles of the mobile. I could, I could describe a melody that is that mobile, but the beauty of music is that the wind is blowing and that mobile is starting to turn and new angles of geometry are presenting themselves as that object turns. So I'm like, oh, that's where the melody goes, bing, bing, and the little sound over here needs to do its thing. And then I start describing the space around this object. And like I, I named a record Liquid Geometries last year to basically identify that that's my process of making music is these liquid geometric forms. And so when I go in the studio, I literally like, I'll hear a melody. And then as I begin to work with it, it it's almost like transcribing a three dimensional shape, like oh the, the entity that is that song appears to me as a three dimensional shape that's moving. And so the, the composition process is really just, oh fuck, okay, that thing is happening. Okay, it needs to do this. And it's, it's intuitive, that feels right. So whatever that is, whatever like my brain does and the way it uh, translates sound and emotion and inspiration has become my sound. And it's, it's like my own particular technique of engaging with the creative process that apparently has a, a particular sound to it. Wow. I love hearing that. I definitely see shapes and sounds and I see textures and I see things when I'm listening and playing music as well. But like, I'm not a creator like you are, like you're somebody who's really pulling it out of the ethers, you know, and you're, yeah. you are this transcriptionist of, of this. Yeah, and so it's amazing. Even on this record, like I, dreamed a whole section of music, the bass line, exactly the notes. And I got up and I was like, oh shit, write it down before I forget it. And like it became one of the pieces on the record. I feel like those things are already out there or already in here. And it's like, it's like an infinite number of objects and it's just grabbing one at the right time and, and honoring it by not trying to make it something else and describing it how it wants to be described. Wow. Oh my God. What a, it sounds like a really powerful yet delicate process, you know? Yeah, and I, I trust the process. Like if I'm not feeling the flow, I do not try to, to work in the studio. Got it. It's a, what, if it's flowing, if it's happening, awesome, cool. The second it's feeling like work or I'm getting frustrated, I can't find the right sound. Oh yeah, just step away. And so I don't spend as much time in the studio as you would think. I wait for when the inspiration is flowing and then the tracks like write themselves. It's literally just going in and like, I hear the next piece. Okay, I gotta do that. Oh yeah, right. That thing's gonna happen there. Write the piece, then it's done. I love hearing that. And I know there's obviously, everybody's got their own process and some people are like, nope, I'm in the studio from eight to noon every day or certain oh, right. writers do that. They're just like, I'm sitting with the pen and even if it's a blank page for four hours, that's what my thing is. So well, I make space for that, for sure. Like I have a very, when I'm not on tour, having some type of schedule is very important. I go to the gym at a certain time, like eat my breakfast, have my coffee, sit. Okay, these are the hours that, you know, 10 to six for me usually is when I'm in the studio. But if it doesn't flow, then I don't, I don't bother getting frustrated about nothing happening in that space. I open, I make space for inspiration to occur. And if it doesn't show up, I'm not going to get worried about it. Nothing there to me. I love it. I'll and go walk the dog, I'll go read a book. I'll play video games, whatever gives me, you know, some way to disengage from obsessing about whether or not this music is happening. Uh, that's what I go do until it flows. I love it. And, and so for all your fans out there and all the artists who are coming up in this new day and age where we've got, you know, we can go write a song and produce it and get it out in an afternoon if we wish to with the technology that we have. Um, obviously, the music industry is changing, the touring industry is changing, everything's changing of how to become and stay uh, a viable artist who can support yourself. What would you say to these young artists that are coming up who are just like, fuck man, there's 10 other million people like me and they got cool ideas and I got cool ideas and should I tour or should I keep my day job at 7-Eleven? Like what would you say to these artists for their art to come through their hearts and souls? I mean, I, I, each one of those artists would, would uh, elicit a different response from me based on where they're at. But I think the one universal I could say is like, focus on finding what your voice is so much more than attempting to sound like other artists or capture a particular sound or a particular scene. Like if you sound like you, you're probably, probably going to be okay. Cause there will be people that are fans of that. And yeah. it's, it's a decision I made early on in my career that I wasn't going to chase whatever the, the sound du jour is and try to make music that sounds like it. Because the second you become, uh, 
second you become the sound of the time, that sound is going to pass and you're no, like, it's like locking your creativity down to a moment or, you know, being regional. Oh, that's the sound of Austin or whatever. If you become that, then you're kind of stuck, you're pigeonholed. And if that sound is no longer in vogue, then what, you're going to keep chasing whatever else somebody else is innovating. Better to spend that time figuring out what it is that makes you, you. Love it. Yeah. I mean, it's such, uh, and it, and, and I'm hearing you say like, be patient. Like it, it may take a minute to come out. Yeah, no. And listen, listen, if you, if you stop and listen, what is it that, that I hear here? Not, Oh, if I make the bass sound like this, it'll be like this other cool track that's blowing up right now. The track itself is, is a, a sounds really uh, metaphysical and I'm just going to use it as a metaphor for now. The track itself is a living entity. Your job as an artist is to pay fucking respect to the needs of that entity and how it wants to be expressed. So if you listen, the piece of music itself will tell you how it wants to be formed, what its baseline is, how what the aesthetic space is for that piece of music. When I feel like music gets fucked up is when I try to make it something other than what it is. Hmm. And my my weed whacker guys are back. So, okay, cool. I know we're going to wrap up. And I think of it like I just, as you were saying that Evan, like I think of it like you're like the midwife for the song. Totally. Like the midwife helps it come to life. And it's the midwife's job is to serve the life of the baby when it comes out. It's going to be you like the, you know, if you're fucking deep into dubstep, then when it comes through your brain, that's how it's going to express itself. But have the integrity to allow a piece of art to be its own thing without being referential to other things. Like we don't need more of the same thing. People's ears will respond when they hear something new or different. So yeah, yeah. my advice would be just honor, honor your own process, honor your own voice, honor your own ear that's hearing something different and pay attention to it. Yay. I love that. I bet a lot of people are going to hear this and take it to heart and hopefully move forward with their artistic career endeavors um where can everybody find you sweetie uh i mean the usual socials blue tech official i think on facebook blue tech official on instagram i'm on soundcloud blue tech online.com is my website lots of vinyl and cool products on my Bandcamp page is blue tech.bandcamp.com all right, cool. I'm going to put all this stuff up on the website, you guys, at djvaleriebelove.com forward slash podcast. And here, this is the my name. And uh, uh, on both sides of the house now. This la, la. is go meditate and be like, this is your time. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we'll put all of your links up, Evan, on um, on my website, and we'll be putting a bunch of stuff on social. And oh my God, th- this has been such an honor to get to share all this time with you. And I'm so happy for you with this new music and this video when are you is the video real can anybody see it now or yeah, the video comes out october 4th so october 4th. Airs, like that's that's the video premiere date okay so. cool 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 and are you putting it on all the social media or is it going to be youtube where is it going to be uh it is already uploaded to youtube and waiting for me to publish and well of course it'll be on all the social media so. okay cool yay and i think i'm sure there'll be some blogs that are featuring it and stuff there's, there's a awesome publicist person doing her job and making those things happen so yay awesome all right cool well thank you again so much and congratulations and you're you look and feel amazing i'm so happy for you and uh i'm so grateful we got to do this time together um let's everybody i just love to do inhales and exhales at the beginning and end of the podcast so how about we do that let's inhale some love everybody And exhale some peace out to our beautiful planet. All right. Peace, love, and aloha. (laughs) 